of the Psalms. Uh, the shepherd David sends us a very important message. As a matter of fact, um, I want to I want you to listen to a couple of things that David had to say today. This is the shepherd boy David. Israel's greatest king was David, the shepherd boy who became king and ruled Israel for yea now 40 years. In the 33rd chapter of the book of Psalms, I believe the verse is 12. Uh, the 33rd chapter of the book of Psalms, and I believe the verse is 12. It is 12. Verse number 12. Those who have it will say amen. amen. Let's read it. What does it say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The, the Bible 12, verse 12, all we need verse 12, I'll ask for what I need. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. I want you to, I want you to remember that top line. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. David wrote that years and years, millenniums ago. He said, blessed is the nation and ours is a nation. I want you to understand that. Ours is a nation. Uh, we live in the nation of America. But look what he says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. Now I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter number 12. Uh, well, no, 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 no. Go, turn back to Psalms 9. We'll go to Proverbs in a minute. Turn back to Psalms 9 from 33, flipping backward in your Bibles to chapter number 9. Uh, Psalms chapter number 9. Psalms number nine. Let me see the verse. Let me see the seventeenth verse of Psalms number nine. Let me see the seventeenth verse. Look at it. The wicked shall be turned into what? And all the nations that what? talking about the nation the wicked shall be turned into hell and every nation that forget God David says blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and then he says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all that forget God. I want to impress upon your minds the, the fact that we are living in a nation and it's called America. Now flip to Proverbs, uh, the 34th chapter, I believe it is, the 34th chapter of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 34, 14, I'm sorry. 14, I got it back, 14 and verse 34. 14 and verse 34. Oh, there it is. There it is. Proverbs 14, 34. Those who have it will say amen. amen. Listen, righteousness exalteth what? But what? Is a reports to who? Now, now, now. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, our nation is in decline. 
let's have it. Let's, you can have your seat. We're going to see how that happens here. <clears throat> and I shan't be long. But here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that, they, that the Bible says, yes, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And then he says that every nation like the wicked, the wicked shall be turned into hell and every nation that forget God. Now, I, I, I just want to speak briefly. I, I don't want to speak. A, I, I don't want to speak long, but I just want to speak briefly. I just want to put something on your mind because I think we are at a critical period. I think we are at a critical period in American history. Here's what I want. What I want you to do as you sit there on your seat. What I want you to do. I want you to take a backward step take a backward step out of the nation in which we now live so we are part of America but what I want you to do is I want you to I want you uh, on the blackboards of your minds uh, I want you to take a back step a couple of steps back and then I want you to look at America as if you were not a part of it I want you to look at our nation as if you were not a part of it and I want our nation I want our nation to move in a montage before our eyes so we can get a look at how far we are from God. Now here's what's going to happen. You see the Bible says blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. And if our nation is not being blessed. And if we are going in decline, yeah. if we have reached a tipping point, then there's a reason for it. So what I'm asking you to do on the blackboards of your mind, I'm asking you to just step back and let's watch this movie together. Uh, let, let's watch the montage watch the frames as they come before our eyes and then while you are doing that let the text that we read uh, run across your mind and, and, and that is that the wicked shall be turned into hell and every nation that forget God. Remember David says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now we'll step back and we'll take a look at the montage that's before us. We'll take a look at our nation and I want to do this very briefly. I don't want to take a whole lot of time in doing this. Uh, we begun to see a decline in our nation long before 1920 but that's where we will start in, 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 in 1920 
soon after World War II, World War I, we had an age called the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties was an embellished age right after the war where America felt that she had nothing else to lose. She won the war. Money was good, income was good, and so as a result, they began, America began to rebel against that which really had any value to it. If you see pictures now of the Roaring Twenties, you see uh, people jittybugging and women in the little short dresses and they were doing whatever they were doing, and it was an age of rebellion. It was an age when America had reached the point that we have nothing to worry about. Easy come, easy go. And that led us into 1928, one of the greatest economic depressions that this nation has ever seen. So then the Roaring Twenties become an age of rebellion. God became insignificant. We want a war. We got to be good. We got to be better. We have, we are, we are stronger. We are more mightier than any other nation. And then we move from uh, the 1920s quickly uh, to about 1945. 1945, we find ourselves just after the Second World War. And in 1945, we have the age of secularism. Now, if you want to write the word down, it's S-E-C-U-L-A-R, S-E-C-U-L-A-R, secular. Now, what does the word secular mean? The word secular mean worldly as opposed to religious. And then uh, the year 1945 ushered in not only secular thinking, but secular humanism. Now what is that? Secular humanism. Secular humanism is confident in an acceptance of faith in the human being or into humanity and promoting that which satisfies humanity rather than that which satisfies God. So secular humanism uh, is a religion that's concerned only with that which appeals to humanity. We call it the age of me-ism. M-E-I-S-M. Me-ism. That's the age where men began to think of themselves more than they did about God. This is the age where the world began to move forward with the Darwinian theory. Charles Darwin believed uh, in a simplistic way that man sprang or came from a monkey or some lower animal. This is the age when America sought to force our evolution into our public schools. It was already uh, being taught in some public, some secondary institutions, but during this period, uh, America tried to force into public schools the study of evolution. They took the position that if special creation is going to be taught, 
then evolution should be taught. Which means that America and the powers that be sought to give the young people of America another idea as to where they came from. To give them an, another idea that postulated the philosophy that you may not have been made by God. You may not be a special creation. It may be that you evolved from a monkey. It may be that you evolved from some lower animal. And if you will remember, if you will remember, the idea of evolution uh, during this period took place, or the concept took place in a legal forum in Dayton, Tennessee, where you had uh, William Cullen Bryant and uh, 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 as an attorney uh, in the Scopes trial, S-C-O-P-E-S, -E the Scopes trial lasted almost six months and the discussion was between whether or not evolution should be taught in the public schools. Of course, Scope lost the decision but the fact is, during this period, the emergence of that idea into the public schools where our children would be faced with the idea that they may not have been created by God, they may have been, or they may have come into existence by some lower animal. The results of that, we begin to see in the behavior of our children. They began to act like little animals. Uh, Y'all gonna help me along here. Uh, in certain instances. So this 1945 period saw something else. It saw the emergence of complete land eliminating God from the public place. I said this was the age when emerged the idea of taking God out of the school. Taking God completely out of the public place. It didn't begin there but it emerged and there was an effort on the part of our nation to take God out of every public place. And that is you can't mention God anywhere. And it was in this period, during this period, that we have the emergence of the Darwinian theory. It was during this period that we had the emergence of, the, of taking God out of the public sector and taking prayer out of schools. It started during this period. But then we move to 1960. From 1920 to 1945 to 1960. What is going on in 1960 in our nation? Our nation in 1960 has made a complete change. In the 1960s, we had the emergence of the drug culture. Now, folk were doing drugs before that time, but not to the extent that they, would, they started doing them in 1960. And not only that, but they were glorified. Many of you don't know anything about the hippies, but the hippies began publicly showing how to take and get involved with mind-altering drugs. 
Some of you are too young to know anything about LSD. But some of y'all in here uh, know about LSD. But, but this is the age of the drug war. This is the age of the drug culture. This is the age when the drugs began to come into African American communities. This is the age where our young folk really got involved with drugs and it was acceptable in society. This is secondly the age and the emergence of the television age. This is the age when television now is on and you can watch it longer than any other time. And those of you who uh, know anything about the pre-60s, doesn't make you old, I know anything about the emergence of the dawn of the 1960s, you will remember that uh, you used to stay up and watch television because you know what's going to happen at 12 o'clock, you're going to hear the national anthem. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and when you heard the national anthem, you know television. But it was during the 60s that this began to change. And our nation now is owned by and run by hedonistic secularists. And these secularists believe that money is the only criteria. They do not care about what you see. They do not care about what effect what you see may have on you. They don't care about any of this. They care about the almighty dollar. Now what you see on tele television don't go off at 12 a.m. anymore. Television is on 24 seven. And not only that, a television doesn't really get ruckus and television doesn't really get nasty until about 12 o'clock. When you cut the cables off, they stay on all night long. And you see all three X's, four X's, five X's, are all kinds of dirty movies on television. Well, um, this began, didn't end there, but this began to emerge in the 60s. Not only that, but the third thing that affects our nation emerged in the 60s, and that is that parents decided that church was not important to young folk. You see, that was a time prior to the 1960s where you had to go to church. It was not a question about, uh, do you want to go? Prior to the 60s, we were brought up uh, in an atmosphere where mama made sure, or daddy made sure that you went to church. And not only that you went to church, but that you behave yourself while you were in church. But the 60s brought in a new philosophy. And that philosophy uh, was, I'm not going to do my children like my mama did me. And I'm not going to make my children go to church like mama made me go to church. And that was the concept. And so the children of the 60s was not made to go to church. It was left up to them as to whether they went to church. But those of you prior to the 60s knew that knows that we had a mama or a grandmama that made sure we went to church. But the mindset of parents during the 60s was, whenever I get any children, I'm not gonna make them 
go to church like mama made me go to church. Now I want you to watch this as we watch this uh, frame go by. So when the children of the children of the 60s grew up, they, y'all ain't getting this, they had no concept of God. When the children of the children of the sick, now this isn't true across the board. I'm not saying every woman, every man, every family in the 60s did this. What I am saying is we had more doing this than not doing this. That's what I'm saying. So, so, so now we have the children of the children of the 60s believing that church is not relevant. As a result, they have no idea or concept of God. They have no idea, no concept of evil. That's why you have more, 25% of all African American men between the age of, of 18 and 35 are in jail. Because they are children of this. You know what? As, as I was thinking about this the other day, uh, the thought came to me that would be that would be a good uh, uh, thesis topic for somebody writing their thesis. That would be a good topic for someone doing a PhD dissertation. And that is prove the fact that uh, the majority of African American men that are in jail now are the children of the children of the children of the 60s. Guaranteed that it will be the case because it was during this age when this concept started. This concept of not making children go to church, that's not new. You see, and that has not always been either. Because those of you who have reached my age, almost my age, you know that when we came up, there was no question about whether or not we were going to church. But this is a new idea that emerged during the 60s. And because of that, because the children of the children of the children were not made to go to church, and I use the word made advisedly, uh, they were not uh, encouraged to go to church. As a result, they have no concept of God. They have no concept of right and wrong. And as a result, the sixties then are responsible. And the parents of the sixties and the government of the sixties are then responsible for raising a group of young folk that have no respect for law, for honor, for God, or for parents. Now let me tell you something. On this business that emerged in the 1960s, where the children of the children in the 1960s decided, and we may have some folks sitting here today, who will say, Doc, you know, I don't make my kids go to church. Okay, that's fine. But that's a result of the mindset of the 60s. And if you got a minute, if you got a minute, I want to tell, I want to, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. We have walking around, we have walking around on the streets of Fort Lauderdale, children that are beyond counseling. I say beyond counseling. Children that you can't counsel. And this is why. Because of the emergence of the idea and the conceptualization that church, God, or Christ, or the Holy Spirit was not important. And as a result, they grew up without any value system. They have no value system. Now listen, what does a child beyond counseling look like? What does a child beyond counseling, and what do you mean, Doc, by beyond counseling? 
I mean a child that you can't tell anything. Because in order, in order to counsel a child or anybody else, you have to have certain pressure points. You can't counsel anybody without pressure points. You can't counsel anybody that does not care about anything. You can't counsel a man or a woman when they tell you, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care. If he tells you he doesn't care, you might well let it alone. Here's why America is in trouble. It's because our young folk are in trouble. Because we have sown to the wind and we are now reaping the whirlwind. Here's why. You need to raise that child in the church. And here's why at the Heights we ask mothers and fathers, send us those kids, get them in, in these, these youth activities. Uh, let them get involved in, in behind the table thing. Let them learn the, 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 the scriptural text. Let them get involved. Let them know the difference between right and wrong. Send them to Sunday school. Make sure they get... Uh, the reason kids are not coming to Sunday school is because mama is not coming. Because check mama out. Mama classifies as either a child of or a child of, or a child of somebody in the 60s. Check her out. Check her out. Check daddy out. And he, and, 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 and when you check them out, you will find that the 60s had something to do with it. But here's why I said, here is why you need to bring your child to church. And young folk, here is why you need to come to church. And if you have a daddy or a mama that doesn't encourage you to come to church, here's why you need to come anyway. Come in spite of your mama. Come in spite of your daddy. Now, there are, there are three pressure points that an individual has. any one of which allows the counselor to apply pressure that will eventuate in change. Now, the child has to have respect for his parents. That's number one. Number two, a child has to have respect for God or a higher power. A child has to have respect for law that has to do with right and wrong. Now, when Johnny comes in for counseling, the first thing a counselor does after he or she establishes rapport through felicitations and all that sort of stuff, the counselor then began to try to figure out what the problem is. Once the problem is on the table, you got three ways to deal with that problem. Parental, religious, or legal. You ain't got three ways to deal with that problem. 
So now, <clears throat> Xavier, I see where we're having some problems here. I see where you're missing school. I see where you've been tardy for the last six weeks. I see where you've been sent to uh, time out or whatever they do out there. And I see where you, where you, where you uh, been in three fights in the last six weeks. Now, Xavier, uh, I don't think your mother and father would appreciate knowing that you are having these kinds of problems. That's a shot at pressure point one. But if that child says, I don't care what my mama knows. As a matter of fact, I don't even know where she is. And I haven't even seen my daddy. Strike one. Now I got to try strike two. Now I got to say, Keith, um, you know, the Lord would just not want you to, to do that. The Lord loves you. And the Lord wants the best for you. And the Lord wants you to be the best man you could be. Keith, you were made in the image of God. And this is not the way the Lord would want you to behave. If the response is in the neighborhood of what I'm about to say, then this book is beyond counseling. Look, I ain't into, I ain't into this religious thing. At, uh, but Keith, do you go to church? No, I don't go to church. Keith, have you ever been to Sunday school? No. Keith, do you, do you believe in God? God? What do you look like? Now you're going to have to back up off of that because you can't get no traction on that. Now, I got one more shot. Keith, if you keep this up, you're going to wind up in jail. Keith, if you keep this up, you're going to find yourself dead out there on them streets. Keith, if you don't straighten up, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. Now, if Keith said, Look here, let, let, let me tell you something, counselor. Most of my homeboys in jail. I don't mind going to jail. At least I get three meals a day. As a matter of fact, going to jail ain't nothing but homecoming for me. Now, there is no pressure I can apply perennially. There is no pressure I can apply from the God standpoint. There is no pressure I can apply from the legal standpoint. What you got here is a dude that's beyond counseling. He has no value. He has no sense of right and wrong. So when he still have caps, or when he snatches a purse, or when he sticks up a hold up 7-Eleven, 
he feels no pain. And the reason he feels no pain is because there are no pressure points. That's why you need to get sister girl in church. That's why you need to get brother man in church. That's why you need to get yourself out of bed on Sunday morning, wake him up and say, we going to church this morning. Because if you as a parent and you as a father, if you don't bring that child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you got a person growing up beyond counseling. You're not going to be able to handle him. And the law enforcement not going to be able to handle him. And the only thing that's going to happen to him, somebody going to have to shoot him. Now don't shock me down, but I'm preaching good. Here. What I'm saying is, that's why young folk need to be, now I'm not talking about all young people. Don't, don't stop getting tight on me. I see some of you getting tight. All young folk are not that way. I'm explaining the 25% of our men that's in jail. And boy, if somebody would do a study on that, I am almost certain that it will be shown as an hypothesis that the majority of those young men in jail are the result of the 60s and the concepts of the 60s. It was, it was that concept that many took that said, I'm not going to make my children. go to Sunday school and I'm not going to make my kids and for those of you who have children in college don't be so concerned about whether or not they're singing in the choir your first concern ought to be why you in church on Sunday that's your first concern. What good is money in the hands of a dude that doesn't have any pressure points? I mean, so you get a scholarship, so you get a good job, so you become a computer tech, and so you get your degree in communication, and so you make good money. But if you don't have a concept of God, you don't have any moral values. And it doesn't matter how much money you make, it will go straight through your fingers. And so, that's the result of the six, and I don't have time to get to all of that, but I, I'll, uh, because you see, this is the age when legalized abortion emerged during the 60s. Infanticide emerged during the 60s. And when you look at all of this stuff and how far we, our nation, have come away from God then you have to say, we need to do something. Because God says, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And every nation that 
can't forget God. It was, it was during this period, the 60s, I said I was going to quit, I am. It, it was during this period that fashions began to change. You may not admit it, but I remember the miniskirts. Don't be laughing, Michael. You remember them too. Yeah, I remember the miniskirts. Emphasis on mini. It was during this period when shamefacedness went out the window. It was during this period where we had show and tell. Not show and don't tell, show and tell. It was during this period that there was a concerted effort of rebellion against the values of the Bible. It was during the 1960s. And I'll finish this tonight and show you where we have, where, where we have come and where we might be going. And then I'm going to show you what can be done about it. Because God says, if my people. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that, that, that's tonight. The only folk that can save this nation. Yes, are the people of God. is going to listen to are his people. For the eyes of the Lord is over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do iniquity. The decline of the nation. I will show you tonight how many abortions we have in America. How many babies are killed. I know this is a little heavy, but uh, I know, I know, I know. We perform more abortions in America than any other country in the civilized world. Abortions a year. And that was that was two thousand five. And then you wonder why America is at her tipping point. Then you, if you understand history and the ages through which this country has gone and is going and how far from God we have gone. A nation will not long survive 
without God. God made the nation. And blessed is the nation who's God. But the problem, the problem is the man that's in the nation. It's the woman that's in the nation. God repented that he made man. Can you imagine? He made the skunk. He made the roach. Oh, don't shot me down now. God never said that I, 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 I hate I made roaches. God never said, I hate I made rats. God never said, I hate I made mosquitoes. God never repented of the fact that he, that he made skunks. But he repented that he ever I'm quitting, I'm quitting, I'm quitting, but before I quit, let me tell you, man is so honorary. Man is so downright cruel. Man is so crooked. Man is so self aggrandizing Man is so egotistical. Man is so selfish. Man is so honored until if left to his own devices, man would kill God. You leave him alone and he'll kill God. Or kill you, he'll kill God. Because he did it. I said he did it. cry out and say crucify him his blood be on our head man has become so crooked and without God he is in this world by himself and he is dangerous left to his own devices he would kill God if he could man walking around now if he could get God by the collar he'd kill him right now. because it's in him yes, sir. Yes, sir. that's why Jesus said without me yes. and so I ask you today yes, do you love the Lord yes. we're the only one that can save planet earth we the only ones. Only those who believe in God. Because God made the world and everything therein. And God loves us and he'll hear us. And if you're sitting out there and you need strength. You're sitting out there and you need the church to pray for you. If you're a single mother out there and you're having difficulty with bringing up four kids, three kids because the husband is gone. Or if you're sitting out there and you're a man and you're trying to bring up two kids, three kids because the wife is gone. And you need help, you need strength. Come on down to the altar place and we'll pray for you. That God will bless you. And he will bless you. And those of you sitting out there with children in this church right now. Those of you sitting out there who have, who have children coming to to, to buy uh, 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 that's church age I want to say to you don't you dare get up on Sunday morning and leave that book in the bed don't you dare get up on Sunday morning and leave her in the bed as long and I know folks don't like you to say this but as long as they're in your house you know I, I know folks oh that's that old time stuff I know, I'm going to talk about that tonight because you know, it was doing that. Well, I'm back again. Uh, it was during the '60s that uh, parents 
who were children of the children of the 60s, uh, did not uh, consider grandma as knowing anything. And, and, and they raised their children uh, by the, the laws uh, and the outline and the guidelines of Dr. Spock. Y'all ain't never heard of Dr. Spock, have you? Yeah, but back there in the 60s, uh, wives had Dr. Spock's handbook. Dr. Spock, how to, uh, how to rear children by Dr. Spock. You don't need to be rearing a child by, by, by the mandates of Dr. Spock. You need Dr. Jesus. That's what you need. Because that's who that child's going to need. And if you're here today and you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, you need strength. And you want prayers for you, not only for yourself but for someone else. And come on down to the altar place and we'll pray for you. And if you're sitting out there today and you're not a child of God, as I described the ages that, that this country has gone through, that our nation has gone through, and trying to show you that if we do not come back to God, sad will be our case. And finally, I said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You see, so I'm hopeful that, that those of you who are Christians, who are children of God, that you'll be on your knees every day. Praying for our country. Because when you look at what's going on in Washington and what's going on in the election, in, in these whatever these primaries, when you look at how vicious people are and how the stuff they are saying about each other, they need our prayers. They, they, they really need our prayers. And if you're not a member of the body of Christ, if you're not a member of the church of Christ, here's what you need to do. If you will believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day for your sins, if you will make up your mind to repent of all of your past sins, Luke 13 and 3, if you will be willing to get up off your seat this morning and come down and make a confession, a public confession, and that is, I believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, if you make that confession, the 8th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 36 through 39, we will baptize you for remission of your sins. And the Lord, Acts 247, will add you to the church. And the angel will write your name in the Lamb Book of Life. If you brought a friend and that friend want to come to Jesus, you walk with that friend, bring them down here. And if you hear friend and you're not a member of the body of Christ and you want to become a member of the body of Christ, you want to be a part of the church of Christ, just come on down here. We'll work with you. We love you. And the only thing we want for you is that you be saved. If you're here and you desire prayer, if you, young folk, if you are here and you're working on your pressure points, but you're having some difficulty, do you have three, the three viable pressure points that your preacher gave you? If I were to say what your mama think, would, would that bother you at all? Would you care whether or not your mother knew that or not? Or would that bother you? If it does, then of course, you're doing pretty good. And, right, and that goes for the other two. I don't want to go over them again. But young folk, even if you never heard this before, develop your pressure points. Develop a respect for your parents, a respect for God, and a respect for law. You see, and even, even if you have never been told this before, if you would just do that, and love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and if you would just obey him and let his word have a lodging place in your heart, you'll be all right. Yeah. Would you say yes to the Lord today? I'm going to give you a chance to do it. Let us together stand. And while we are standing, would you come down? Let us pray for you. Would you come and be baptized for remission of your sins? Yeah, yeah. His victory will have.